scripture slides should have said Exodus chapter 40, not Genesis. My apologies on that, but well read. Stephanie, some of you thought, is this inspiring scripture or an instruction manual? We'll come back to that in a moment. But friends, it's good to be with you today. My name is Charlie Dunn. And, you know, after preaching last Sunday, I preached on Genesis chapter 28. And uh, later in the day, my wife Brandy asked me, she said, isn't it your intention this fall to preach through over 16 weeks the entire storyline of the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation? I said, yes, that's the plan. We're going to go through the storyline. We're doing that through this theme of what it means to do life in God's presence, which often is associated with the temple or the house of the Lord. Uh, to which Brandy responded, well, we're five weeks into the series and you're still in the book of Genesis. Don't you think maybe you need to pick up your pace? And you don't get any more candid feedback than from your spouse. But today, we're going to pick up the pace. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. We're going to do a sermon covering the entire book of Exodus. And it's 40 chapters if you know the book of Exodus. And I'm assuming many of you are probably familiar with this storyline in Exodus. And if you are, you know the first half of Exodus is packed with action. It's packed with drama. It begins with this murderous Pharaoh who wants to kill all of the baby Israelites who are enslaved living in Egypt. And this little boy Moses, his life is is spared as he floats down the river in a basket. He's found by the daughter of Pharaoh. She raises him as her own child within Pharaoh's court later in his life, having fled from Egypt after murdering um, someone, uh, Moses encounters God at a burning bush. He has this encounter with God where God calls Moses to go to uh, Pharaoh to free the Israelites from their 400 years of slavery in Egypt. He has these, these confrontations with Pharaoh. Eventually, God sends these 10 plagues upon the people of Egypt. Ultimately, the Israelites are freed. They're able to leave Egypt, and then when the Egyptians pursue them, God um, causes the Red Sea to part. They're able to cross on dry land. They come to Mount Sinai, where God is giving them the Ten Commandments with with flashes of lightning and thunder. It's it's a storyline that is so full of action that DreamWorks could make a kid's movie out of it, and they did. It's called The Prince of Egypt, or... You could make a best picture winning drama starring Charlton Heston, and it's called The Ten Commandments. Some of you have seen it. The first half of Exodus is packed with exciting drama and action. And then you get to Exodus 26. And for 16 chapters, you read these incredibly detailed instructions for the building of the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, as you heard Stephanie describe this morning, was this this structure in the middle of the Israelites' camp. There was a, a curtain that went around the outside to create a courtyard, but it didn't have a roof over it. And then inside the courtyard, you had an altar, you had basins for washing, and then inside the the, the center of the courtyard was another tent structure, a big curtain with a roof over it. And in the first part of that tent was what's called the holy place. And that's where they had the the bread and the, the, the lamp and the light were kept there. And then if you went even further, there was a really thick curtain and you would go inside what was called the holy of holies. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And I can tell I have lost some of your interest already. And maybe if you set out to read through the Bible and you got to Exodus 26, those 16 chapters, maybe for you, you felt like were kind of boring or bizarre. Frankly, all of the different rituals around how to worship and serve God within the tabernacle. Maybe you think to yourself, God, you are off to a really good start in the storyline of the Bible. But but why Why does it seem as if the the storyline almost derails with all of this focus and preoccupation on the details for building the tabernacle? Why all of this focus on the tabernacle? 
Now, let me try to put this in terms that we Americans can understand. I assume most of us in this room are Americans or you're living in America. And, you know, the American experiment began with this, this declaration of independence. And in the declaration of independence, we said, what do, what do we want out of life? We want, we want three things. Do you know what they are? We want life, we want liberty, and we want the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, I'm here this morning to tell you that you can't have any of them without the tabernacle. That there's no happiness without the tabernacle. There's no liberty without the tabernacle. And there is no life without the tabernacle. Let me, let me show you what I mean. So first, there's no happiness without the tabernacle. So there's this, this scene in the middle of the book of Exodus where God has brought his people out of their slavery in Egypt. He brings them to Mount Sinai to give them his law, the Ten Commandments. He's about to give them the instructions for building the tabernacle. And Moses is up on the top of the mountain meeting with God and the Israelite people while Moses is up there, what do they do? Well, they revert back to the gods that they had been worshiping in Egypt. They build a golden calf as a way to try to reconnect with those Egyptian gods. And when God sees this, you remember, God is a person, so therefore God has emotions. We've talked about this if you're, if you're reading in our Emotionally Healthy Spirituality book. God has emotions. God is hurt. God is angry. God is upset when he sees that his, his people, in spite of all that he's done for them, now they're, they're worshiping these other gods. And so God wants to be done with the Israelites. He wants to, to judge the Israelites. Moses prays for them, and God says he will forgive them. And yet God essentially says to Moses, look, Moses, I don't think this is going to work out. It's like God is giving a breakup speech to Moses on, on behalf of the Israelites. He says, I don't, I don't think this relationship is, is really going to work out. It's not going anywhere. And, and frankly, it's, it's, it's not me, it's you. It's the Israelite people. You are, are rebellious. You are selfish. You are idolatrous. You're going to worship these other gods. And so I don't think we need to move forward together. But here's what I'm going to offer you. God makes a deal to Moses, to the Israelites. He says, here's what I'll do. I will still bring you into the promised land. The land that I promised to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you can still have that land. And what's more, I will bless you. I will make you prosperous. I will give you security. I will give you a, a prosperous and wonderful life in the promised land. There's just one thing. I won't go with you. My presence will not go with you into the land. God essentially says to Moses, he says, look, you can have prosperity, you can have peace, you can have success, you can have security, and you don't need the tabernacle. You won't have to have a tabernacle. You won't have to have any of the, the washings and the sacrifices and the offerings and the confession and all the worship and things that go into the tabernacle. You don't need any of it. You can have all of the blessings of the existence of God without any of the maintenance costs of the worship. You can have that. And I wonder, I wonder, would any of you be tempted to take that deal? Any of us be even just a little bit inclined to take that deal? You can have all of God's blessings. You just don't get God himself, the relationship with him. But how does Moses respond? Moses, Moses will have none of it. Moses refuses to take that deal. Instead, what does Moses say to God? This is Exodus 33, 15. He says, God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Moses says, God, if we don't have your presence, if we don't have your glory, God, if we don't have you, then essentially, we, I'd, I'd rather we just die here and dwindle here in the desert. 
In other words, what Moses is saying is he's saying, look, God, I realize there is no true happiness. There's no true joy. That Actually, it it would be better just to die. Life itself is not worth living if we don't have your presence, if we don't have you. One of my favorite worship songs that I listened to preparing my heart for this Sunday is based on these words of Moses in the book of Exodus. It's by a duo, Shane and Shane. The song's called Without You, and there's a lyric that says, God, if your presence goes, I don't want to stay. And if your presence stays, I don't want to go. God, it's you that I want most. God, it's, it's relationship with you that my heart most longs for and needs. And, and friends, I think this is what so many people in our world um, do not yet understand. Maybe, maybe do not grasp this, 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 this notion that, that it's God himself that our hearts most long for. You know, I think a lot of us think, well, if I, could just, if I could just have more of God's gifts, if I could just have more of God's blessings, if I just had enough of God's good blessings in my life, if you gave me Elon Musk kind of money, you gave me Jeff Bezos kind of money, if I could have all of the things that I want out of life, well, then surely I would be happy. And yet what Moses recognizes, what Moses grasps here is that, that all of the good gifts that God provides to us, these are, are ultimately just meant to be pointers, invitations to the one person who alone is able to truly be the fulfillment of all of them. If I could put it to you this way, I don't know if any of you, you know, love adventure, you love mountain climbing, but, but, but in every mountain, that has ever called to you to say, climb me? Or if you love your family and every every pair of outstretched arms that has ever reached out to say, hold me or love me? That in every piece of beautiful music that has ever moved you, or in every bit of, 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 of work or accomplishment that has ever invigorated you or in every sunset or landscape that has ever amazed you. That that, that in all of these is what Moses ultimately found to be true, that really every joy, every blessing, every beautiful thing, every pleasure that we've ever longed for or ever had, it, it, it really is an invitation to know the God who is the fulfillment of them all. I I try to remind myself of that often in the morning when I wake up. Psalm 16 is one of my favorite prayers to pray. And Psalm 1611 says, God, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. God, it's your presence that my heart most longs for, that my heart most needs. And you see, the tabernacle, here's the thing about the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a symbol. It was a manifestation. It was an assurance of God's presence. This idea that God was going to dwell in the midst of his people. His presence was going to be there among them. That's why the tabernacle was located right in the center of their camp. And so, therefore, what, what this means, friends, is that, is that, Moses recognizes, the Israelites at least to some degree come to recognize that that there's no true happiness in life, there's no true joy in life without the tabernacle unless God's presence is is dwelling in our midst. And and listen, if, if you're here this morning, some of you say absolutely, amen, I see heads nodding, but if you're here this morning, and, and maybe that just sounds kind of crazy to you. Maybe that doesn't really make sense to you. Maybe you don't really understand that. Maybe you've never experienced that for yourself. Maybe you think to yourself, frankly, I might take the deal. If God were offering all of his blessings, but I don't get him, I don't know. That doesn't sound so bad. Can can I just encourage you to keep searching, to keep questioning, to keep asking until you find what Moses found, until you find what many in this room have discovered? 
Because otherwise, what you'll do is you'll spend your whole life chasing after your happiness where it ultimately cannot be found, where it cannot be kept, and you might as well spend your life chasing after the wind. There is no true happiness, no true joy without the tabernacle, without God's presence. But then secondly, there's no liberty without the tabernacle. There's no real freedom without the tabernacle. If there's one word that you might use to kind of describe the whole storyline of the Exodus, it's what? Freedom, liberty, liberation, freedom from Moses, freedom from slavery, freedom from oppression. This is the reason why often um, people groups who are living in some state of bondage or some state of slavery or oppression have absolutely loved the storyline of the Exodus. Story of liberation. Even our uh, American, you know, founding uh, parents who were under the tyranny of the British and wanted to be liberated from them. And certainly, ironically and and tragically, uh, African slaves who were in bondage in the United States who longed for their freedom loved the story of the Exodus. It's absolutely a story of freedom and liberation. But how do we tend to define freedom today? As 21st century Westerners or Americans, how do we define freedom? What's freedom? Freedom is freedom from Pharaoh or freedom really from any master or freedom from any Lord over your life. Freedom is is having no restraints having no restrictions on our individual choices. To be free means that as long as I'm not hurting someone else, then I can do and I can be whatever I want to do or be. I belong to myself. I am my own. That's the way that we tend to define freedom today. But is that the freedom that is being offered or described in the book of Exodus. Is that kind of freedom, I belong to myself, really even possible at all? You know, you read through the story of the Exodus and it's only 14 chapters in that the the Israelites are, are free. They're outside of Egypt. They're no longer enslaved. They're no longer under Pharaoh. For our modern purposes, by our modern definition, we'd say, yes, now they are free. They're no longer under another master or lord. And yet, the moment that things go badly for them, the moment that the Egyptian armies start chasing after them, how do they respond? They are terrified and they're, they're, they're sarcastically bitter and angry. Do you know what they say to Moses in Exodus 14, verse 11? They say, Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? And of course, that's biting sarcasm, isn't it? Because Egypt was graves central. I mean, graves in Egypt were like oil fields in Texas. You think about the pyramids that the Israelites were were building. I mean, Egyptians cared very much about their graves. There were plenty of graves in Egypt. This is biting, angry, bitter sarcasm. And what's more, they go on to say this. They say, Moses, um, it, it would have been better for us to continue serving the Egyptians in Egypt than for us to die here in the wilderness. And you think about that, they're they're presenting that as if they've got essentially two options, die in the wilderness or still be slaves in Egypt. But are those their only two options? Do these seem like very free-thinking, reasonable, liberated people to you, even in the way they're processing this situation? Well, no, I mean, because you think about it, I mean, they just watched irrefutable evidence of this omnipotent God who is so committed to them that he would bring the most powerful empire on the face of the earth to its knees. You might think they would at least say, hey Moses, how about an 11th plague? Do you think maybe God's got one more in him at least to have some recognition that, hey, maybe God could take care of us here? They're not even thinking about that. There is no hope. They're cynical. They're depressed. They're bitter. Now, do these people seem free to you? Do they seem like they're thriving and flourishing and 
and happy and, and joyful and hopeful people? Well, no. Why? Because even though they're no longer enslaved in Egypt, you're not really free until you have the tabernacle. You're not really free until you are worshiping and serving the one true God. And by the way, you see this in the language in the book of Exodus. You know, in the book of Exodus, God never says, let my people go. Some of you look surprised. We, we thought he said, let my people go. Maybe you know the kids' song, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh baby, let my people go. You know that one? It doesn't say that. It says, let my people go so that they may serve me. Let my people go so that they may worship me. In other words, you're not really free until you are worshiping and serving the one true God. And the idea that you can really just serve yourself, I think Exodus, it, it really subverts, it really challenges that notion, this idea that I can belong to myself, I can serve myself. Really, can you? Is that even humanly possible? You know, I think Tim Keller probably makes this, this case better than anybody that I have, have read before, helped me to see this, that all of us, are trying to build a life. And therefore, all of us, we, we look to something to, to, to tell us that we have a life, to tell us that we matter. And, and whatever it is that you're looking to to give you a life, that's what you're going to serve, and that's what's going to control you. The idea that you can just serve yourself, it's an impossibility. It's a fiction. Everybody serves something or someone. question is who or what are you serving? And by the way, if you don't believe Tim Keller on this, if you don't want to take his word for it, maybe Bob Dylan's uh, word on this would have more weight with you. I don't know. He sings in his uh, album, Slow Train Coming. He's got a song called Gotta Serve Somebody. He says, you may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You might like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. We all serve somebody. We all serve something. The question is, what, what are you serving? And is it ultimately going to lead you into flourishing and freedom? Or in the end, is it going to crush you and oppress you? And you know, in the days of the Exodus, the the, the Israelites were unique. The Egyptians, every other people group believed that the gods had made human beings, why? To be their slaves, to be their servants, to do for the gods all the things that the gods didn't want to have to do for themselves. And in some of the myths, the gods regretted making humans because they were so difficult and noisy and bad servants and slaves. And yet that was the notion that that's what humans were for. But you see, the God of the Bible and the God of this, this, this story who revealed himself to the Israelites and who they were coming to know through the Exodus was a God who created people not to be his slaves, but to bear his image. And, and this was a God who, who didn't create out of need. Think about in, in the storyline of the Bible, Genesis 1, you, you see a little glimpse of it. This God is Trinity. Let us create mankind in our image. And what that means, if, if God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is that before God ever created us, before he ever created the world, he didn't need anything. The members of the trinity were perfectly loving each other, perfectly serving each other, perfectly glorifying each other, perfectly building each other up, rejoicing in one another. So that when God created the world, he did not create out of need. He didn't need glory. He didn't create out of need for love. He already had love. He created us to share in his glory. He created us to share in his love, to share in that Trinitarian life that God has always had. Now, Some of you might say, well, if that's true then, well, then why does God need us to worship and serve him at the tabernacle? In fact, maybe some of you have, have said this before. If not, you've thought it in your mind. You've thought, 
Why does God need a world full of all these people who are worshiping him, telling him how great he is? I mean, doesn't that seem a little bit egotistical? And wouldn't that be kind of egotistical if any person that we knew said, I want everybody to worship and serve me? And you know, one person who who thought that way uh, was C.S. Lewis. This was his kind of objection against God. He said, why would, why would God want everybody to be worshiping him? That seems really egotistical until, as he was reflecting on the Psalms, he came to this recognition. He says, I noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. In other words, what he's saying is you can't really enjoy any good thing in life without praising it. That part of what makes any good thing enjoyable is praising it. I didn't go to the University of Texas, but my wife did and many of my family members did, and I like cheering for their football team. And it's an easy year to cheer for UT football. And and last Saturday, you know, when they went to Michigan, the defending national champion, they hadn't lost at home in like 23 games. And when they went into Michigan and and UT football beat Michigan so soundly, I, I, I had fun. It was enjoyable to watch it. But, you know, part of what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to to talk to people who also were happy about it. I wanted to praise the way they'd played. I wanted to find Pete Townsend and say, Pete, you love UT football. Wasn't it amazing how they were able to win, you know, so, so, um, uh, you know, definitely and and, and by such a margin. You, You want to praise something as part of how you enjoy it. Even if it's a new restaurant you find that you really like, even if it's a new dish that you cook, if it's a new hobby that you have, part of the way that you enjoy good things is by praising them. And so how much more so would that be true if it's not just any good thing, but if it's the best thing? If it is literally the best being and person, the most beautiful, most praiseworthy, most powerful, most pure being in existence, friends, you can't experience the the joy that God wants for your life without praising him. That in many ways, the, the call for us to worship God is for our joy. It's for our enjoyment to get to worship him. And, and friends, so when listen, when, when you... When you do that, then, when you, when you worship and you serve this God, it leads you into greater freedom. Freedom from insignificance, discontent, freedom from bitterness, freedom from, from uh, anger, but also freedom for, freedom to become more the kind of loving and wise and courageous person that God is. It's it's. Freedom that comes on the other side of of worshiping and serving this God. And so the the question for us to ask is never, how do I have a life without any restraints? How do I have a life without any restrictions where I can do and be anything I want to be and do? Listen, you don't have any flourishing in any aspect of life without restraints, without discipline. without restrictions on your choices. If you want to become a great athlete, You better believe there's restrictions on what you can eat and how you exercise and how you spend your time. If you want to have a great marriage, you don't come to the person and say, I'm happy to be married, but I don't want any restrictions on my individual choices in this relationship. Good luck having a relationship based on that. Any kind of friendship, any kind of career success, whatever it might be, You you always have to have restraints and restrictions. The question is not, how do I have a life without any restraints? The question is, how do I have the right restraints? The right disciplines, the right morals, the right laws that are going to help me ultimately to, to thrive and flourish rather than crush me or oppress me. And listen, friends, you can, you can believe when God gives you restraints. He gives the Israelites his, his law. He calls them to worship and serve him at the tabernacle. When God gives us restraints, you can trust they're for your good. Not only because he created you, 
Not only because clearly he wants you to share in his joy, but what's more, he is the God who was willing to lay down his very life for us so you can trust him when he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's no freedom. There's no real freedom to be who you were made to be without worshiping and serving the true God. No liberty without the tabernacle. But then there's one more. One more thing, there's no life without the tabernacle. Maybe you're convinced, you're persuaded, you say, okay, I want to be happy, I want to be free. Well, then come on, God, come live in our midst, come tabernacle in our midst, and, and, and I'll come into God's presence, and I want God's presence in my life. But you see, there's a problem. It's a problem for the Israelites, it's a problem for people today, namely the fact that you can't just waltz in to the presence of a holy God as a sinful person. You can't just waltz into the presence of a holy God. And you see, that's, that's what all of this business in the tabernacle of the curtains, of the barriers, of the washings, of the sacrifices, of the priests, of the offerings, that's what all of this is meant to convey that, that, that our sin separates us from God. That we can't just freely go into God's holy presence and live. When you look at the end of Exodus chapter 40, verse, verse 35 says that, that when God's glorious and holy presence descended on the tabernacle in a cloud, it says Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Not even Moses, the, the, the most holy and faithful member of the Israelite people, could enter God's intimate presence and live. Because God is a holy God. You, you see this, remember a few weeks ago, even in the Garden of Eden, when, when Adam and Eve sin against God and they're cast out of the garden, what does God do? He sets up the cherubim and a flaming sword. As though to say, the only way back into God's presence is to face God's judgment, is to face the sword. The wages of sin is death. And, and in many ways, what the, what the tabernacle is doing is, is it's, it's seeking to answer this question of, of how can a holy God dwell in the midst of a sinful people? And part of that is the sacrificial system. We'll talk about that more together next Sunday. But that's really what the, the question is. How can a holy God dwell with a sinful people? How can you enter God's presence and not lose your life and not face God's holy judgment? And you see, the tabernacle, in a way, with all of its you know, strange barriers and washings and sacrifices was a, was a partial answer to that question. But, but we know much later in the story that now God has given us a full and a final answer to that question. John chapter 1 says that, that the word of God, the second person of the Trinity, who was with God and who was God, that the word became flesh and literally it says he, he tabernacled among us. He dwelled among us. That's, that's uh, John 1.14. And, and we'll come back to that in this series. We'll talk more about what that means. But to suffice it to say for today that, 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 that God actually didn't just come to dwell with his people. But that one day he was willing to, to dwell as his people, to become one of his people, to ultimately go to a cross and there to suffer and to die and to take into himself all of the judgment of God for our sin. And you know, after Moses had set up everything in the tabernacle, we're told that, that Moses finished the work. That's Exodus 40, 33. And so Moses finished the work. But you know, on the cross, Jesus, Jesus cried out and said, it is finished. Because there, Jesus had truly 
finished the work of reconciling a sinful people to a holy God. And when he did that, we're told that curtain, that thick curtain that separated the holy of holies, it tore down from top to bottom as though God were saying, you're not going to need this anymore. You're not going to need curtains. You're not going to need sacrifices. You're not going to need washings. You're not going to need all of the rituals of the tabernacle anymore. Why? Because Jesus finished the work and he has done everything necessary to remove our sin from us so that we can freely enter the presence of God without fear. It is no longer dangerous for Christians in Christ to enter the holy presence of God. We can have life eternally. We can have true liberty and freedom to become the people that God made us to be, and we can have happiness, learning to dwell in the very presence of God. Now, partially, but one day, fully. But certainly, truly, we get to experience that presence of God that our hearts need and long for every time we come to the Lord's table together. We get to commune with God's presence. And so would you pray with me, as we come to the table this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we know that even if we wouldn't say it out loud, even if we wouldn't affirm it consciously, we know how many times in the desires of our heart we would gladly take the deal to have your blessings without your presence. And we thank you, Lord, that in spite of our sin, you are still a God who who wants to dwell with us and that you have made a way to do that, first through the tabernacle, but now ultimately through your son, Jesus Christ, that you have tabernacled with us. And Father, I pray for those of us in this room today, Lord, I pray that we would not be deceived into believing that the good gifts of this life are meant to be a substitute for their giver, but would we begin to see them all the more as an invitation to know the God behind them? Lord, would we believe that the restraints that you put on our lives are not burdensome, but actually meant for our freedom and for our good? I pray, Lord, that even leaving here today, we would, we would give, your, give ourselves to you more and more especially in those areas where we have wanted to be our own master and Lord. And Father, as we come to this table this morning, would you soften our hearts? Would you remind us just how good and loving of a God that you are, that you would lay down your very life for us so that we could come to you without fear, knowing there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Friends, on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples, and after giving thanks to God, he took bread and he broke.